Baker. Mayor Steam. Present. Councilmember at Large Anderson. Present. Councilmember Hagan. Present. Fisher. Present. Enright. Present. King. Present. Austin. Present. Helly. We have a quorum, Your Honor. Thank you. Item one is a motion for approval. Or item one is a motion for adoption of the ad agenda with the addition. You need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Item two is a motion approving the minutes from July 3rd, 2017. Need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Item three under uh, recognitions, awards, and reports. We have our Human Rights Commission here talking about the welcoming report. Jason Baskin is the chairman, and he's going to. There he is. He's going <laughs> to explain it to us. And I think this is our second year with this. Yeah. This is our first one. That's our second one, isn't it? Yeah, so this will be the first ever welcoming report, okay. but second year as part of Welcome America that kind of got the whole process started. Okay. Want to introduce your commission? Yeah, so I'm Jason Baskin, chair of the Austin Human Rights Commission. I'm joined by Miguel Garate, fellow commissioner, Obawa Obawa, fellow commissioner, Leah Colbert, and Jessica Swanson, also fellow commissioners. And then we have Dan Mueller in the back, who will be a commissioner hopefully in about 20 minutes. And <laughs> Richard Lemons, Commissioner Emeritus. I don't know if that's a real title, but <laughs> we told him he could resign from the commission, but he still had to stick around and help, so. You can whatever you want to. <laughs> I like that, see it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, thank you very much for having us. Um, as I said, my name is Jason Baskin, Chair of the Austin Human Rights Commission. Um, and we've got a, probably a 10 to 12 minute presentation. Obviously, if you want to ask questions as we go through or at the end, um, certainly more than welcome to. But tonight we're here to present the welcoming report, which is a report that we had talked about in January, the last time that we were here, um, and has been unanimously approved by the Human Rights Commission. And really the reason that we're talking about welcoming tonight is that the face of Austin has changed, as most people in this room know, over the last 30 years. So I want to start with a couple of numbers. Number one is 23%. 23% of our population is non-white, according to the latest census data. And that's up from 2% in 1990. There are 47 different languages spoken at Austin Public Schools, a number that continues to grow every single year. And really what that shows us is that the vast majority of the diversity is at the age of 40 and younger. So a tremendous opportunity for our community moving forward. And finally, 4.1%. Our population has grown by 4.1% since the year 2000, making Austin a shining star when you think about a lot of other mid-size outstate Minnesota communities and the fact that we're actually adding population as opposed to losing population um, like sister cities are. And you know, the numbers do a really nice job of painting the picture, but I think a picture really brings to life what this is all about. And so this is the 2001 Austin High School boys basketball team. And you can see this is the 2017 Austin High School boys basketball team. I have a question. Yes. What place did, uh, did the white team come in? <laughs> I don't believe. I know we came in second last year. <laughs> I don't believe we ever got past the second round of sections. Okay. I'm, just, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. You know, when you think about diversity and working together and what you can do, you know, the fact that they've played in, what, three of the last five state championship right. games and we never made it to the section final, I think is a nice microcosm of <laughs> what is possible for us as a community. Of course, getting people like myself off the team really helped boost the athleticism <laughs> as well. So Coach Vanis has done a much better job. So a welcoming community is really defined as a community that's guided by principles of inclusion where everybody feels welcome. So whether you've been a recent immigrant and have been here for two months, or you've lived here your entire life, if you feel like you can have an active stake in the community and you can play a meaningful role in helping it maximize its potential, that's really what a welcoming community is all about. And the benefits of a welcoming community are not just that it sounds good or it feels good or it's the morally right thing to do, which are all true, but there's a pretty strong economic argument to make in favor of welcoming as well. So if you look at data from the Minnesota State Demographer, the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and Partnership for a New American Economy, what they tell us is that welcoming communities grow faster welcoming communities have a stronger ta tax base and economic base and it ultimately 
welcoming communities have a much better workforce because when you look at the state of Minnesota and you look at southern Minnesota, our domestic migration is negative over the last 10 plus years as people pass away or they move to larger population centers or dare I say warmer climates, though probably not today. And if we're not bringing new residents into our state and into our community, we're going to be alike a lot of the sister communities that we're at. And so if you look just in the first congressional district, so southern Minnesota, immigrants and refugees on an annual basis generate over $240 million of tax revenue for local governments and over $700 million of spending within the local economy. And obviously, from a state standpoint, we have more jobs than we have people to fill them. And so if we want to keep and retain and attract new businesses, we need to make sure that we have the workforce that's able to fill those jobs or they'll go to other areas where they have them. So there's a strong both moral and economic argument to make in favor of being a welcoming community, which is why it was so enthusiastic to see the council last year unanimously approve Austin becoming one of the first two cities in the state of Minnesota to join the Welcome America Network. So obviously we joined last year in January, we sat in front of you and talked about that as a commission, we wanted to help move that vision closer to reality by identifying what is working and what are some of the barriers that still exist that we need to solve. So what this group and a number of other people have done is spent the last six plus months going out into the community to get input. We've done interviews, we've done focus groups, we've talked to community conversations and gotten people, whether they've been here for six months as an immigrant or they've lived here for 86 years and everybody in between, their opinions. And that insight is really what's driven the report that we're presenting here tonight. So what did we find? Well, the first thing that we found was that Austin's got two things that we're doing really, really well when it comes to diversity. Number one is that diversity already exists here. So we've got about a 20 year head start on a lot of communities that are just starting to deal with the changing demographic because we've had to figure things out. And it hasn't all been perfect, but certainly there's much more awareness and we're much further along the path than where a lot of other communities are. And in addition to that, key stakeholders across the city have embraced diversity. When you look at everybody from major employers to city leadership, including yourself, to nonprofits and churches, there's a recognition that diversity is not only where the overall country is going, but where our community is going. And so we've got to figure out a way to make sure that we do it right to be prosperous as a city. But while we're doing a lot of things well, what was really enlightening is that we identified five barriers that really are currently preventing us from turning that vision into a reality. And I want to talk about each of these individually to add a little bit of brief color. So the first barrier that we found from our research is that there's a lack of interaction between groups. So for the most part, what you see happen is whites stay with whites, Hispanics cluster together with Hispanics, Anuaks are with Anuaks, and so on. And you don't have people working together like we saw, say, on the basketball team to really try to maximize the potential of the community. And the three reasons that we found that that exists is number one, that it's hard for people to understand what are their common interests. You know, if I talk to somebody who looks and acts a lot like me, I can probably in a couple of minutes figure out something that we have in common, whether it's baseball or family, something that we can strike up a conversation and build a bond on. But if somebody's from a totally different culture and I don't know anything about where they're from and they don't know anything about where I'm from, that becomes more difficult. The second thing that we found is that there wasn't as much, I think, hostility as much as there was a knowledge gap. There's certainly pockets of people who are hostile to newcomers, but for the most part, what we found is there's a lot of confusion as to who are these newcomers in our community? Why are they coming to Austin, Minnesota of all places? Where are they from? What kind of cultures and traditions do they have? And I think if we can start to lower that knowledge gap on both sides, obviously that helps from a common interest standpoint. And then obviously language will always continue to be a barrier. You know, it depends on the community and it depends on the overall kind of generation of where we're at. But language certainly does play a role, but I don't think precludes us from being able to solve a couple of the first two issues. The second barrier that we found was communication. And in communication, not only are the groups not necessarily working together, but we're not doing a very good job of having them communicate even within each other. And so what we found is that in a 
size town like Austin, there's a lot of informal networks that exist. And if you're not plugged into that informal network, there's not really a great way to get information. And this isn't just an Austin problem. It's a problem from a marketing standpoint in that, you know, there used to be three channels and one newspaper that everybody read, and now there's so many different ways that people get information. And so we need to find ways to evolve those informal and formal networks to make sure that we're actively communicating with people in the way that they're currently consuming media and currently want to hear things. But beyond that, we also have to think differently. If we want to go after people and, you know, bring them into our organization or our city, we probably have to do things differently because if we have the same meeting at the same time and it happens to be at a time when they're working or maybe it's at a place that costs money or a place that isn't easy to get to if you only have one car in a family, it becomes really tough for people to show up. And so there's a great analogy in the official report about the welcome wagon that you know the welcome wagon didn't wait for people to come to the wagon, the welcome wagon went to people. And I think if we wanna communicate, we've gotta think differently about how we go to people and actually be proactive rather than just kind of the come and see me if you need anything type of mindset that a lot of folks in the community have. The third thing that we found was leadership development, especially within the multicultural community. What we heard time and time again is the leaders who are crossing between groups end up getting relied on for nearly everything. And the folks that are maybe interested in joining the city or joining organizations tell us that there's two barriers. Number one is, I don't see anybody that looks like me in the group or on the council or on the planning task force or whatever it happens to be. And even if I want to really do it, I don't really have necessarily the knowledge or feel like I have a good understanding of what the rules and processes are to participate. You think about something like Robert's Rules of Order, I'm not sure I even have a phenomenal understanding of parliamentary procedure, and I've lived in Austin, Minnesota my entire life. Think about something, somebody coming from a war-torn country where you have you know, a government that was trying to kill you and your family because of who you were. Obviously, some trust in governmental institutions is going to be a little bit lower there. The fourth then thing that we found in terms of barriers, something that we've heard a lot in a lot of different areas, and it really comes down to transportation. You know, Austin as a city is built to be accessed by car. And that's the way it has been developed, and that's the way we probably will be for a long time. But understanding that, we probably need to think differently about if people have unreliable transportation options, or maybe it's difficult to, I can get around on a bike in the summer, but it's tough in the winter if the sidewalks aren't plowed. You know, how do we make ways that Austin becomes more accessible for people in a way either in where we hold locations or at least have an understanding that the ability to hop in the car and drive halfway across town isn't necessarily in the wheelhouse for everybody. And then finally, the fifth and final one, again, something that we heard in a number of different areas was, was the housing piece of it. And really it happens on both ends. Number one is kind of the low end around affordable housing. And when it comes to being a welcoming community, what we heard from a lot of folks is, it's not just can I find affordable rental property, but is it rental property that fits, say, an eight or nine person family? because I don't necessarily have the funds to rent two apartments that are next to each other. And so there's definitely some issues there, which I know as a city we're working on, but even on the high end issues that we're working on, where if somebody comes for, say, Hormel, if they can't find a house that meets their needs, they don't necessarily want to build a house, how do we make sure that we have available supply for them to be able to make the decision to live in Austin instead of moving down the road to a Rochester or Stewartville? So those are the five major barriers that we found that are standing in the way of Austin, turning that vision of being a welcoming community into reality. So as a commission, we put together a lot of different ideas. We got a lot of community input. And really what we rallied around was three key ideas. There's a lot of other ideas that we have in the appendix of the report in terms of if somebody has a community organization and wants to make some changes in these areas that are listed. But we wanted to put our full weight behind three key recommendations. So the first recommendation is that as a city, we should create a strategic welcoming plan by the end of 2018. And the thought process is that saying we want to be a welcoming community, but not having a definition of what success looks like is never going to allow us to get to where we need to be. And there's an old adage that you measure or you manage what you measure. And so we need to have a group and what we're recommending is that the mayor appoint a seven person cross-functional task force from across the city to sit down and hammer out what do we define success as, what are the metrics that we're going to use to measure success, and then what are the strategies that we want to put on. We could make recommendations purely as a human rights commission, but if we don't have the opinion of the schools and of other community organizations, ultimately they're not going to be the right thing for us to be able to create real and meaningful change. 
The second recommendation that we have is that the city should proactively increase the diversity of city boards, task forces, and commissions. Because when you think about how do we get people more involved in our city, these are great feeder programs for people to be able to do that. I think if you ask any of the people that are on a commission, whether it's the Human Rights Commission or the Planning Commission or anything else, you learn so much more about how your city works and operates and who the right people are to call by being a participant in that. But if you look at what our overall population looks like and what the demographic makeup of those boards look like, it's a very different experience. And so I know that we've looked at this in the past. What we need to probably do differently is number one, set a very clear goal of appointing at least five new multicultural members by the end of 2018. But number two, doing things differently to go out to churches and community organizations and let's go to the places people are already at to talk about this is the role that you want to have on here. And we probably need to think about some level of informal training to, you know, here's what a committee does, here's what a subcommittee does, so that people feel like they can make a meaningful difference and actually be successful in participating. And then the third and final recommendation is that the Human Rights Commission should work with key stakeholders to increase exposure um, of different groups within Austin. And so this really involves two parts. Number one is we're going to go out to at least 10 different community organizations and present a very similar version of what we're presenting to you here tonight. I think until we get this message out into the community, we're probably not going to make much of a difference. So if there are any community organizations that would like us to come and speak, we would be more than happy to do that. And then number two is the Human Rights Commission. We're a nine-person volunteer commission with a $4,500 budget. You can't necessarily change the world with that. And so let's work with the people who have better resources, or who are already working in great areas like this, like the United Way, like Apex, and help use these insights to make their jobs better and help them to get better results, and we'll continue to do that as well. So that's the highlights of the welcoming report. Those are the recommendations that we have as a commission, and I'd be happy to turn it over to any questions. Yeah, I have one. Uh, do you think the best success in welcoming diversity exists in childcare like Apple Lane? I think childcare definitely, yeah, I mean, when you look at the younger generations, there's definitely a huge success rate there. Um, you think about the success program with the schools, you think about daycare centers, whether it's Apple Lane or in-care daycare providers, and the fact that, you know, I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and you know, for them, diversity is just a way of life because those are the people that they go to daycare with. Yeah, so do you think that's probably one of the best areas that we should put our emphasis and, and work into is starting them at a younger age for this diversity? Yeah, I think that the younger generation definitely is an area for us to focus on, but I don't think it's kind of a necessary but not sufficient solution um, because we know within a couple of generations a lot of these issues are going to solve themselves, but we don't necessarily have that doesn't do anything for the folks in the in the interim. And so I think there are definitely steps that we can take to make, say, the next 30 years better. And ultimately, if we start here, overall, we're going to get even higher for that younger generation. I, I absolutely agree that we need to be going where people are. Yeah. And, and that's one of your recommendations. And, and we'd like to, you know, maybe start jumping in there as soon as we can, you know, and, and with this uh, seven member commission, that would, that would be um, good focus area you know to start with because and, and we were at recently in June there was a League of Minnesota Cities meeting and I attended um, one of them it was kind of about this topic and they that was one of the primary recommendations from a panel was there about go where people are good. you know whether that's you know community picnics whether that's uh, you know churches or, or other you know uh, ways to connect so uh, I applaud your work. Thank you very much for, for the hard work that you've done on uh, you know, finding these barriers and pointing out some good things as well. Thank you, Janet. Well, I know we had a, we, I met with you last week or was it the week before? Why don't you get a hold of me and we can sit down again and I mean, you know, some of the, we've worked on putting minorities on commissions and it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge finding people that want to do it. You know, I think a lot of people are apprehensive and, you know, and, and uh, we need to find ways to do it. It's just... Right. Mayor, Mayor, can I speak to that briefly? Sure. Yeah. Um, I did reach out to the Welcome Center and a couple of other groups, obviously. I, well, I handle the Planning Commission matters and um, the mayor makes appointments and I help select sometimes um, candidates for the Planning Commission. 
Um, and I was, the feedback I got was that a lot of immigrants are just really overwhelmed mm -hmm. with everything else that's going on in their lives that they, that to take the time to, to get involved in more community activities is just, that's the barrier is what I was, the feedback that I got. So I'm, so I, I mean, I would love to have a list of people who feel like they could take on additional um, community activities um, and that's something that they want to do. And then also language as a barrier too, potentially. Um, but those were a couple of the comments I got. Yeah, and I think, <clears throat> Howie, we could absolutely help with that as well, is, yeah, it, it, it'll be a while before we probably get to a 23% representation on you know, commissions and task forces, but I think we can definitely help. You know, let's start with five, and we can probably help to at least get to that five and move in the right direction. Great. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jason, thanks for the report. I think it was very insightful. <coughs> One point that I really picked up and resonated with me was that it isn't that we're so much unwelcoming as much as indifferent as a community and being purposeful about our efforts in this regard, I think is where it's really at and trying to go a little bit further than where maybe we're comfortable and putting, a, putting ourselves in uncomfortable circumstances and trying to put ourselves in their shoes as well. They're in some uncomfortable circumstances as well. So recognizing that and appreciating that. So thanks, there's some tall orders in here uh, but thank you for pushing us, and we'll, we'll look to address those as we can. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, Jason, and thanks, Commission. All right. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Moving on, number four, we need a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. Say, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Hold number five under public hearings. It's a public hearing to review a tax increment financing plan for tax increment district number 14, North Point. Thomas. Uh, before council tonight is a public hearing to discuss and hopefully approve tax increment financing district number 14 for the city of Austin. This would allow for a housing district um, out north in the Fox Point area so that 38 townhomes could be constructed. Um, this is a housing. Uh, development housing tax increment district for which almost all costs related to such are eligible for tax increment financing. They're looking at a 25-year district and projected revenues are in the range of just under $900,000 that would be coming in from the proposed tax increment district of which the um, three rivers for which Susan Strandberg is here and John Erickson is also here from the HRA if there are any questions for which part of those $900,000 worth of funds would be remitted, rebated back to um, the agency to help offset costs related to the uh, development of the project. Additionally, there is dollars within the budget for some potential contamination issues out there, at which time it appears uh, if there are any and they have to be remediated, the HRA would take the lead in that and we would remit back to them some tax increments to help clean up the, the, the area. Um, again, as I noted, this is a 25-year tax increment district, um, and at this point in time, I'd certainly open it up to any questions, but basically, as many of you know, tax increment districts, 100% of the taxes go to the city of Austin for this district, not split between the county and the school, for which then again, we use those to rebate back to the developer to help them lower the cost to make the, the, the project happen. Without tax increment financing, this, uh, district for this, they probably could not make the cash flows work to actually do the development. Council, any questions? This is a public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience tonight that has any questions or comments on this? If not, we need to entertain a resolution. So move the resolution. Second. Uh, Mr. Tanker. Councilmember Hagan. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Number six is a resolution under bid openings and awards receiving bids for BJ parking lot improvements. Mr. Lang. Yes. We discussed last summer at work session uh, with uh, owners of the BJ at that time about a project to put together to clean up some uh, material that is located in the BJ parking lot and also underneath the BJ patio. So this project has been put together to address that issue. Uh, we bid out the project for removal of debris, um, removal of a building foundation, and then a replacement of the asphalt parking lot. The plan is to do this project in the fall, later on in the season, and then uh, make way for the property owner to do some improvements 
at their facility then uh, in the spring before they would open up their outdoor patio. Uh, our estimate on the project was $80,000. We had three bidders with a low bidder being Hanson Hauling and Excavating at $84,358.75. You can see very at the very bottom of your handout there is a cost breakdown for city related costs and then also property owner related costs. So we would recommend awarding this project to Hanson Hauling and Excavating. Council, any questions or comments? If not, we need a resolution. So moved. Sir, Mr. Dankert. Council Member Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Council Member Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Under petitions and requests, number seven is a motion reviewing a fence ordinance. Ms. Wallace. Uh, Mayor and Council Members, the, um, there are actually two ordinances. One would amend Chapter 11, um, requiring fencing in I-2 districts, and the other would update our current fence ordinance under Chapter 4. The, um, there were concerns in the I-2 district of areas um, being open to uh, trespass that, um, that had uh, material that was being stored um, that may cause or, or create a danger to um, passers-by. Um, the um, most of the I-2 uh, properties are currently fenced or otherwise secured. Um, there are uh, two or three that may have um, uh, materials and storage that would be subject to this ordinance. Um, one of those would be um, in the Lansing area, there's some vehicles in that particular, uh, at that property that are zoned in I-2 district that could require fencing. And then the um, um, property in the city, um, Palatin, that would also be impacted by this particular ordinance. And then um, I have some, if the, uh, if the council members would like me to go through the fence ordinance and indicate the changes that are being made, I can go through that as well. If there are any questions. Anybody wanted to do that? Apparently not. We've had, you know, we have it in our backup commission. Yeah, and we discussed this at our last work session as well. So is that? Um, just to, for your information, it did get reviewed by the Planning Commission on July 11, 2017 with nine members present. The uh, Planning Commission recommended the approval of the changes to both ordinances, um, nine ayes and zero nays, uh, so unanimously. Okay, council, questions? If not, we need a motion for preparation of the ordinance. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And B is an ordinance for adoption and publication. Move for adoption and publication of the ordinance. Sir, second. Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Council Member Large Anderson. Aye. Ordinance passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Number eight is a resolution approving an annexation agreement for Steve and Deborah Thorson. Holly? Uh, before I go to that one, do I just wanted to clarify do we need a vote on both ordinances or does that suffice? Does the one vote suffice for both ordinances? No, I think we just did the one. There are two separate ordinances, so we would yeah, they were. need a second. Are there two separate, separate ordinances? There are two separate ordinances. Yes. Was well, it all within the fence ordinance? Uh, no, one's Chapter 11 zoning, and one is Chapter 4 fence. So then you need two. Yes, okay. So which one did we do? <laughs> <laughs> I think you did the fence one first. Did the fence one first. Okay, so which okay. one do we need now? The ordinance. Yeah, let's do the, the so zones. we'll say the uh, chapter yeah, 11 zoning ordinance. We did that first. We did that first. Yeah, that's the first That one was the said. fencing in the I-2 district. Yes. Okay. We'll go with that. Okay. Okay. So now we need uh, a vote on the ordinance uh, revising chapter 4. I move that the ordinance be prepared. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Danker. The first action should be a roll call. Yeah. Order, the motion all for in favor. preparation of the ordinance. All in favor. Oh, Aye. all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Move, for, move for adoption and publication of the ordinance. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Danker. Council Member Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. 
King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Ordinance passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Eight is resolution approving an annexation agreement for Steve and Deborah Thorson. Ms. Wallace. Uh, Your Honor, um, the Thorsons have requested or petitioned to the city um, to annex in the two parcels that they own, approximately 4.2 acres in Red Rock Township. Um, this property is located near the golf course um, where there's a small area that has not been annexed into the city, essentially an island um, in the city limits. The uh, Red Rock Township voted on the resolution last night and approved the resolution. Um, the area, um, well, the petitioner is asking to be annexed in uh, for the purpose of accessing city sewer. Council, are Thors is Thorson's here? Uh, oh. They are not. They don't need to be, okay. Uh, no, any questions? Otherwise, we need a resolution. So move the resolution. Just a second. second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member Hagan. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. <coughs> resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Number nine, it's a resolution approving an application for a PSIG grant for Turtle Creek 2. Mr. Lang. Yes, Turtle Creek 2 is an area that was annexed about three years ago with the goal to extend sanitary sewer to them to uh, eliminate illicit uh, discharges to uh, Turtle Creek. Uh, if you recall, last year we were right below the cutoff line for funding. We were the first project below the cutoff line in 2017. So uh, we need to reapply again. And uh, second page of your handout details costs related to the project and eligible costs that are available for the grant. The grant will cover anywhere between, uh, with new legislation, it will cover between 50% to 80% of eligible items. And uh, with this, we would recommend uh, approval of a resolution to submit with our grant application. Mm -hmm. So move the resolution. Second. Is second? Second. Mr. Danker. Council Member Hagan. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Council Member Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. 10 is a resolution granting Charter Commission a franchise extension agreement through December 31st, 2017. Craig. Thank you, Mayor. Members, the original uh, expiration for the franchise agreement was December 19th of 2014. We've had several extensions, and before you tonight is another extension request from to December 31st of 2017. Uh, unfortunately, Charter has had our uh, changes, suggested changes, and hasn't responded to them in a timely fashion. As a result, our attorney has suggested an extension. Council action is requested to approve the extension. Council, any questions? Now we need a resolution. So moved. Second. second. Mr. Nankert. Council Member Hagan. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you, 11. Approving, uh, approving county board classification of forfeited property and declaring the city's intention to reassess unpaid assessments. Ms. Cable? Yes, we had some properties that forfeited to the state of Minnesota for non payment of real estate taxes. Um, we became aware of these properties and then we researched them and find out um, how much in outstanding assessments were on those unpaid tax years. So we have two resolutions. Um, one, the first resolution is for the parcels that are going to be offered for sale um, at the county level. And then the second resolution is a parcel that the city is wanting to retain for redevelopment purposes. It's kind of over in the post office area. So we request um, the passing of both of those resolutions. Okay, we need a resolution for A for properties to be sold. So mm -hmm. moved. Second. Third. Mr. Dangert. Councilmember Hagan. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0. Your Second Honor. resolution for the property the city is retaining. We need a resolution. So moved. Second. Uh, Mr. Dankert. Council Member Hagan. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Council Member Lloyd Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0. You're on. Need a motion resolving City Council to the Board of Adjustment oh. and Appeals. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 12 is a motion reviewing a sign appeal for the Austin Area Commission of the Arts. 
Holly. Uh, yes, Mayor and Council Members, at the July 11, 2017 meeting of the Austin Planning Commission, the Commission reviewed a request from the Austin Area Commission for the Arts for an appeal from the requirements of our city code limiting square footage of certain charitable signs to 24 square feet. Um, the petitioner owns several signs from previous events that they wish to use to advertise this year. The event will be in a new location and the signs will likely be uh, redesigned in 2018. The existing signs uh, are 32 square feet and cannot easily be modified to meet the 24 square foot requirement. After review, the Planning Commission with nine member presence recommended approval unanimously um, for the appeal and to allow the signs to be uh, displayed this year. We need a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, one thing. All right. Resolving the Board of Adjustment Appeals back into the City Council. So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 13 is resolution affirming the vacation of the public right of way in easements in Fox Point and appointing the vac vacation commissioners. Ms. Wallace. Stephen Lang, you're gonna pass it around for a while. <laughs> Tom Danker. <laughs> this is part of the uh, North Point or Fox Point edition, vacating right away in easements to make way for uh, a pending project in that area. Uh, this would be to set the vacation process with uh, the vacation officers noted in your handout there. First Ward, Lonnie Skalicki. Second Ward, Tim Lau. Third Ward, Tom Claprick. It will, we'll make the necessary advertisements for this upcoming meeting. Questions? Comments? If not, we need a resolution. So moved the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes six earlier on. Reviewing a final plot and zoning change for North North Point Edition. It says Holly, but I'm guessing. I, no, I am doing this one. Right. I've done this okay, quite screaming. a few times, actually. <laughs> um, at the July uh, 11th Planning Commission, uh, the commission reviewed a request from uh, multiple parties. Um, including Austin HRA and Three Rivers Community Action, for whom we have representation here tonight. If you have additional questions, um, for, for review of a final plat of a proposed residential development located adjacent to 7th Street Northwest and 24th Avenue Northwest. The development um, will include a 38 unit townhome project and includes lots for single family housing. Um, at the previous meeting, at our council's previous meeting, a preliminary plat was approved. This would be uh, approval of a final plat. The Planning Commission with nine members present recommends approval of the final plat um, with staff recommendations which are included in your backup materials. Um, the recommendation was unanimous. Council, do you have any questions? If not, we need a resolution approving the final plat. Yes. Some of the resolution. Conditions. Is there a second? The conditions. Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. 14 B is a motion that for preparation of zoning ordinance. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? And C is an ordinance for adoption and publication of the zoning ordinance. Need an ordinance. So moved. Second. Mr. Dankert. Councilmember Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Ordinance passed the six year honor. Thank you. 15 is a resolution accepting donations to the city. Need a resolution. So um, second. Uh, Mr. Dankert. Councilmember Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. 16 is a motion appointing Dan Mueller to the Human Rights Commission term expiring December 31st, 2019. Mr. Mueller is here. I think he's going to be a great addition. Uh, any questions? If not, then we need a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Nobody's ever failed these, but congratulations. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Seventeenism. It was questionable right till the end. It was yeah, it was on the wire. Uh, Seventeen is a motion appointing Catlin Olson to the sustainability task force. Term expiring December thirty first, two thousand eighteen. Need a motion. So moved. There's all in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? 18 is a series of motions granting the planning and zoning department to power contract for the removal of junk and or illegally stored vehicles at A816 7th Avenue Northeast of Martinez property. Need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? B104 7th Avenue Northeast Ernst property. Need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And finally, 609 4th Street, or 14th Street Northwest of Gonzalez property. Need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, we do, I forgot about the addition. Thanks, Greg. 19 is a resolution approving a consulting service contract with U.S. Aquatics for the new slides in the Austin Municipal Pool. Jim, I think you probably would tell us all about that. <laughs> Thank you, Mary and Councilor. Yes, I've met with um, the U.S. Aquatics. They've come down to check out our project, and um, I would like to hire them to be our consultants to put together our bidding process and move forward with our project. This is um, a foundation grant, and we're pretty excited about having the old slide replaced. Okay. There are going to be new slides or just replace? New slides. Replace right. the old one. Okay, cool. Any questions? If not, we need a resolution. So moved. We'll Second. Mr. Banker. Councilmember Hagen. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Enright. Aye. King. Aye. Austin. Aye. Councilmember Large Anderson. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. All right. Um, now we are now, when we're finished with our business, are there any citizens present tonight that wish to address the council on any matter? If not, we are to reports and recommendations. Should we always start with you? We'll start with you. Paul tonight. Uh, nothing, Your Honor. Dave. Nothing, Your Honor. Yeah. Uh, since we, our last council meeting was before the 4th of July and the Freedom Pass, I'd just like to congratulate the chamber and the whole city, that whoever was involved with the great fire, the Freedom Fest again. Mm. Okay, that's it? That's it. Jeff. I have nothing, Your Honor. Steve. Nothing, Your Honor. Judy. Nothing, Your Honor. Greg. Uh, nothing. No report? We have one from Kim and Chief Krieger. Okay, we'll start with Kim. Thank you. Um, I'd like everyone to know that a track meet next Tuesday for those three and up is free at the Westcott Field. Uh, events begin at 6 p.m., the field events, and running at 6.30. It's the Noon Kiwanis, and it's the Gene Roden Memorial. You have three-year-olds running track? Yes, we do. <laughs> it's that pretty was, fun. That'd be worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that it? That's it. Chief? Mayor and Council, I would like to remind you that on August 1st, the first Tuesday in August, uh, is National Night Out. Uh, will be held at uh, Veterans Pavilion down by the Bandshell from 4 till 8 p.m. Again, that date is August 1st at the Veterans Pavilion, National Night Out. Okay, anything else? I just want to say our condolences go out to Jane Poppy, who lost her husband recently. Uh, our prayers and, and best wishes go for her and her family. Other than that, if there's nothing else, we need to... No, that was that Chief. Okay. Uh, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. There a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we'll take a short break and we'll need to conference.